In the summer of 1972, the Shah of Iran paid a historic visit to Washington, D.C. His aim? To purchase interceptor aircraft for the Iranian Air Force. At that time, the Soviet Union used its high-altitude MiG-25s to penetrate Iranian airspace. As the Soviet Union shot down several Iranian reconnaissance fighters, the Shah was obsessive in preventing any overflights. The main object of interest for the Iranian Air Force became the F-14 Tomcat. Made by Grumman Corporation, the Tomcat had the unique ability to take on Russia's air supremacy. For the Shah's Imperial Air Force, the F-14 had a high endurance and combat ability. It covered huge areas of Iranian airspace with powerful sensors and weapons. And indeed, Russian and Iraqi MiGs were no match for the supersonic and short-range Sidewinder missiles, the Tomcat's medium-range radar-guided Sparrow missiles, and the long-range Phoenix. And in the years ahead, the Shah spent $2 billion on around 80 aircraft. The investment saved Grumman Corporation from financial collapse, but it also made Iran much more dependent on American industry, engineering, and training. The Pentagon simply did not allow sensitive systems to be restored, repaired, or maintained in Iran. And so for those malfunctions, repairs had to be carried out in the United States at a huge cost. But in 1979, the Islamic Revolution shook up the Iranian-American Cold War alliance, and Iran went from ally to adversary. As the revolution was taking place, the United States ended all cooperation on the Tomcat and enforced a strict sanctions regime. Roman engineers left Iran in 1979, abandoning a fleet of 77 Tomcats and 80 technicians, many of whom were not yet fully qualified. On their way out, Hughes technicians tried to sabotage a string of AIM-54 Phoenix missiles, leaving a portion of the fleet inoperable. And yet after more than 30 years, the Iranian Tomcat continues to command the air. How did Iran overcome the sanctions regime, and how did the Tomcat continue flying? One of the ways to obtain spare parts for the F-14 was through the black market. But there was a problem. The only operators of the Tomcat were the United States and Iran. A known example is the claim of a U.S. customs bust in 1985. The operation originated in London, where an Iranian-British national maintained contacts with an insurance agent from San Diego. And that insurance agent maintained contacts with the Filipino-American community employed at the city's naval base. While the Iranian in London provided the funds, the insurance agent crafted his own network of employees at the base to supply him with spare parts. The employees were in fact warehouse workers with long seniority, and all they needed to do was go to work and take the parts off the supply shelf and back home. The San Diego insurance agent then shipped them as auto parts to the United Kingdom where they were repackaged and then sent to Iran. Iran was desperate for parts to keep the F-14 flying, but it was also desperate to remove the American monopoly on maintenance. The black market turned out to be unreliable, and Iran was forced to hasten its military and industrial capabilities. In 1982, Iran Aircraft Industries and the Self-Sufficiency Task Force made a decision. It called on the country's best engineers and scientists to help maintain the Tomcat. And while the F-14's parts were obtained in the early stages by cannibalizing other aircraft, the next stage involved reverse engineering and manufacturing. In the decade ahead, more advanced and sophisticated components were being produced. And exactly this attitude laid the foundations of the Iranian military-industrial complex. 